Uh, now, uh, we, uh, after Ken, the president of the uh, Taiwanese American History so Society, please come forward to interview Teddy Pichau. Great father to, to daughter. 
So please work hard to get it for Go through that trauma 
find hope to process through it. The second generation, I call the inheritor. These are the inheritors of what happened to the parent. In my story, the inheritor is a, the daughter, the grandmother, is Lisa. Sometimes Lisa wishes she and her mom could connect two mature adults. Each time she reached major milestones in her life, Lisa thought their relationship would change. She believed that when she graduated from high school, when she landed her first full-time job, and when she delivered Abby into the world, she imagined that something magical would occur, and the two of them would finally be able to share heart to heart. Of course, that never happened. The second generation inherit things. They can inherit hope, they can inherit fear. Um, in my story, Lisa, she feels disconnected because her mother is unable to share about her secrets and her trauma. Here are some real life quotes from second generation people. When I was a kid, my parents told me, if anybody speaks to you in Mandarin on the phone, don't say anything, just hang up. Another person said, why did we speak different languages? I didn't understand. Taiwanese, Mandarin, my whole family told me not to question it. Everyone shushed. Only when I came to the United States was I free to really talk about it. There was no one unaffected by two two ways. In fact, my family lived about two years off for two years opposite the Tasha Kutcher rest in touch. Then there's actually something I heard from the children. They're adult Chinese American children of survivors. And this was in 2013. And they said, we didn't even know about it until very recently. Awesome. Um, I For a Taiwanese growing up in Taiwan, I did not know of this tragedy until I came to the United States in 1985. However, I did not want to know more about this massacre until 2003. In my 2004 trip to Taiwan, I learned that one of my relatives was a victim of Tutu Wei. He was one of the lucky, though. He was not a week. He was only a high school student going to a meeting. At that meeting, he and many Taiwanese students were arrested. He was sentenced to 30 years in jail. His family sold five hectares of their land and used that money to bribe the KMT. So his sentence was reduced to five years. After he was released from prison, he became a doctor. Because his beautiful children grew up in the shadow, in the shadow that their dad was once a prisoner. And the engagement of one of the children was ample because the fiancé's family could not bring themselves up to having an in-law who had a prison record, even though he was a medical doctor. So the cloud of the Chitui massacre has lingered. The second generation is often shut out from the story. Sometimes they don't know until much, much later. And it's because we have that silence um, that they don't know and they don't understand. So we need to make sure that we continue and involve the second generation for their own benefit, to know about their family history, and for their knowledge, the true history of what really happened. We know, as Julie mentioned, that I mean the King King National Government in Taiwan, they kept the Great Massacre out of history books for many, many years, and there were several generations that were taught little about this. So this, the third generation I'll talk about, I'm calling the, the unaware, which is the grandchildren. So in my story, there's a granddaughter named Kathy. She's the third generation.
The Taiwanese bend their hands as the bell-shaped fruit. It's a deep red, and its wax skin reminds her of a cross between an apple and a pear. She bites down, enjoying the crispness, combined with the rich juiciness which floods her mouth. She stops as she discovers the middle, flavorless weed covering a heart. She sells, she feels like this bell fruit, looking Taiwanese on the outside, but with a woven facade hiding the core of her inner Taiwanese-American dual self. So this third generation, um, in my story, Abby, she has this mixed identity. She's Taiwanese, she's American, she's trying to figure it all out. Here are some quotes that I've heard from uh, the third generation. Mostly, it's, what's too late? I've never heard of this. And then the other side is, you know, I don't want to do any, I don't want to have anything to do with politics. I try to stay out of all that. So this third generation, um, I guess the issue is that they may not care, you know, because they're so distant from the event. They're a couple generations removed. And what we need to do is continue to make sure the conversation is heard. We need to talk about things that are pivotal for them. First, their struggle with identity and talk about this in terms of identity and heritage. And then second, there's also the, this universal need for social justice and fairness. These are, even though we are commemorating or remembering, or remembering 228, there are injustices that still occur, and these things make it relevant to the third generation. So in 2002, for, uh, 2012, for example, there was a Taipei Times article, and it talked about how you know, there, there were small changes to the, the history textbooks in Taiwan, which basically legitimized the AMT regime. Uh, a quote from the um, P. Legislator Chen was that uh, he, he was talking about President Ma's Taiwanization effort. He said, oh, the, the president you know, it's a piece of the puzzle. Uh, the president's attempt to revise high school history textbook. And that was pretty recent, 2012. And another 2012 um, article it talks about. There was a former Premier Howe, and there were relatives of the victims of the Chiefway Massacre, and they criticized him because what he said was, that only about 500 people, 500 said, instead of the commonly common estimates, which are between 20,000 and 30,000, that about 500 people were killed during the mass. And um, someone really called him out on it. The CPP legislator Lee was saying uh, he accompanied some victims' families at the news conference, and he said, you know, what Hal said in the letter to the editor, which is published in. United Daily News about the 228 massacre is unacceptable because his statement was seriously biased and was a complete betrayal of historic fact. The fourth perspective I have in my novel is the outside perspective, the people who are not directly related to the event. So in my book, there's this man named Jack who comes into contact with the Taiwanese American family. So for him, he says, Bill okay. decides to explore Jack's history. She can learn a lot about somebody from their past. Mr. Shen, where are you from? She asked. I'm from mainland China, but that was a long time ago. I pretty much grew up in the US. I'm from Taiwan, so but he, he flashes his hands before the same then, both Chinese. She stares back down. We are not the same. Chinese and Taiwanese people are not the same. So in my story, Jack, he's unaware of history. He's unaware about significant events like 228. And the, I call this fourth perspective, like the outside perspective, the confused. So things I've heard about Taiwan or Taiwanese history is where exactly is Taiwan? Or, oh, Thai, 
I love their food. It's so spicy. <laughs> or even if like, you know, why don't they just admit they're part of China? But you know, outsiders don't know about the history. They don't know about the complexities of the past. And they need to educate. And I feel that some great things are really happening. And even when Julie was mentioning about the timeline of things that are occurring, one of the things I see is there's transparency in Taiwan. So the brief is that in 1990, the KMT they opened their records. 1992, President Lee asked for reconciliation. 1995, there was a 228 monument built in Taipei. They started it, and then they eventually completed it. They, they left it blank, and then the text was completed in 1997. In 1996, there was Taipei New Park. It was renamed the 228 East Memorial Park. Um, 2003, there's specifically these 228 ceremonies in Taiwan, and they also have issued these certificates, right? These reputation restoring certificates to families of victims who died um, in um, 228. Only about 30 to 40 percent of the victims now be actually accept the certificates. In 2011, they reopened the 228 Museum in Taipei, which was first set up in 2000. So Taipei is becoming more transparent. There's also more awareness, like worldwide global awareness. So with the internet, there's uh, a lot of online stuff. And uh, I think that the nonprofit, the 228 Memorial Foundation, has done a lot to increase education with English documents. Even in the US, in 1997, there was Congressman Pete Sessions. He's from Dallas, Fort Worth. And he actually recognized February 28th as Taiwan Peace Day. So there's a lot more awareness. And then lastly, there's also truth in art, in the art world. There's the nonfiction, uh, we talked about from most of the trade. There's also well, other ones I want to mention, like um, Jonathan Sandler, called Forbidden Nation, A History of Taiwan. He wrote that in 2008. There's the Milo Thornberry's Fireproof Moss, a missionary in Taiwan's white terror. And it's his story of being a missionary during that period. And then there are the novels, which you know, I like novels because they are stories and people connect with the emotions of lives in the story and it helps them to remember and it helps them be intrigued about history, about culture. So the first time I actually heard about 228 in a book, in a novel, was in 2006. There's a one line reference in a book by Justine Chen called Nothing But the Truth and a Few White Lies. But now I'm glad that. People are opening up. There's um, Julie Wu's novel, Third Time, which is just an excellent detailed historical concept. And then my novel, The 228 Legacy, is about, about heritage, the history, and how it affects generations down the line. So um, I, I am offering the book for $16, and it's in the back. It's usually $16.95, it's 15 here. Uh, and I, all the proceeds that I'm getting today, I'm going to donate 10% to TALC, the Taiwanese American Citizens League, because I want to continue and instill that Taiwanese American pride for us to create a strong community. Oh, and one more thing is that my daughter, my lovely daughter, who's a Girl Scout, also, if, <laughs> if she wanted to let you know that if you're the lucky first two who decide to uh, spend twenty dollars and get one book and a box of thin mint Girl Scout cookies, so thank you so much for your time.